Locked On Podcast Network presents Locked On Sports Today. The LA Dodgers have been dominant this postseason, but the New York Yankees stay alive. Also, benching Anthony Richardson is how the Colts plan to stay afloat in the AFC South race, but does it make sense long term? And if you ask the Titans, this is not the year to draft a quarterback. I'm Peter Bukowski, starting your day with the can't miss stories and biggest debates in sports. You're locked on sports today. Searching all major sports. Found. Let's start with the biggest story. The LA Dodgers have absolutely rolled through this baseball postseason. A 3-0 lead against the New York Yankees. Freddie Freeman can't stop hitting home runs. Setting a new record for postseason home run streak. But the Yankees stayed alive in game four, 11 to four. Jeff Snyder from Locked On Dodgers joins me now. And, and Jeff, uh, I'm sure you thought we would be coming on here to talk about a, a World Series championship. That will have to wait for the moment. Let's start with this game four. Uh, how, how did the Yankees finally find some life in their bats that we haven't seen really like all, all postseason? Uh, well, they got to face the Dodgers' bad pitchers, so that helped. Uh, <laughs> okay. <laughs> the, the, the Dodgers had to make a strategic decisions here. You know, you come into this game knowing we need to win one of the next four games. Yeah. Obviously, it would be great to win game four, but the Dodgers' bullpen has been overworked. The fact that they only have three starters, even with all three of those starters going maybe a little deeper in the game than they might have expected, they've still – it's been close games this series. So it's been the high leverage guys constantly and coming into this, it made sense with the bullpen game to see, okay, can we let our lower leverage guys, you know, keep us close, give the offense a chance to win this game. If so, then we'll go to the high leverage guys late. But once they didn't have a lead, they were behind. Then it made sense to just say, you know what, Brent Honeywell go out there and give up, 8,000 runs or whatever it was in the bottom of the eighth (laughs) inning. And and you know what, because Brent Honeywell giving up a bunch of runs was a better option than using your high leverage guys and burning them out. Now they go into game five with all of their good relievers rested Jack Flaherty on the mound. Yeah. It's against Garrett Cole. It's going to be a tough game. They've already won one Garrett Cole start this series. And, uh, and you can make a good case that, they probably should have done better against Cole because they had some hard hit balls, they had some, you know, uh, rough luck with runners of scoring position in that game. So you like their chances in game five. You definitely still really, really like their chances to win one of the next three games because none of those guys we saw pitch against the Yankees today. Daniel Hudson is the only one who pitched today who is possible to pitch again the rest of this series. And we've just never seen a team do what the Yankees would have to do in the World Series to, to come back and, and not make this a series, much less come back and win it. Let's try and put this run into perspective because, Jeff, um, toward the end of the regular season, you and I talked about, hey, this Dodgers team is is kind of kind of wandering in the wilderness a little bit. They did not look like the team, the best team money could buy, right? They have in the postseason. So what what has been different? Is this just a team that was always built for this run? I think so. I think there there is no proven formula to winning in the postseason. The only proven way to win the postseason is to score more runs than your opponents. And <laughs> unfortunately, there's a lot of different ways to do that. Sure. And the best chance is to put together a team of the best players you can find. And that's what the Dodgers, they have a great team of great players. And we've seen, you know, Freddie Freeman this series, Tommy Edmond last series, you know, a very sneaky pickup at the trade deadline. Uh, Shohei Otani has had very big moments. Max Muncy had a huge NLCS. Uh, you know, they, they've had contributions for everybody, plus the pitching has been great. And that's really, if there was a formula, it wouldn't have been, what's it been, 25 years since a team has won back-to-back World Series? Uh, it's not like teams figure it out one year, then, you know, uh, eternal sunshine of the spotless mind, their brains, oh, I don't remember how to do it. It's because there is no formula. All you can do put together good players, hope they get hot at the right time. And that's what's happened for the Dodgers. The Dodgers have played really good baseball in October, and it's the kind of baseball that we knew they were capable of. We saw it at times during the regular season. And, and you know, I was always optimistic that they it would come together. You know, I wouldn't say I was confident because that's the thing about the Major League Baseball postseason. You can't be confident about anything. It's designed to be a crapshoot. It's designed 
the, the fact that we have the two best teams in baseball playing in the World Series is very rare. It's only the third time this century that that has happened because that's how the postseason designed. But for the Dodgers this year, yeah, it's really come down to we have a lot of good players and they're playing really well. It turns out if you have a lot of good players and they're playing well, that's a good formula. Um, that's just really hard to do, too, because you could never plan for injuries and 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 all and slumps and all those kinds of things. Quickly, Jeff, here before we finish up, have you allowed your mind to go to the place where, hey, what about a, a series like this where Shohei Otani gets to pitch, too? I, I haven't even thought about Otani as a pitcher, honestly. I uh, it, It'll be fun when it happens. Um, I, I don't know, because Otani has never thrown a pitch for the Dodgers, I've watched him pitch for the Angels. I've always enjoyed Otani the hitter more than Otani the pitcher anyway. And I do think that when the Dodgers signed Otani, I, I don't think they were thinking we're going to get 10 years of Otani the pitcher. Or, I mean, they knew they weren't getting the first year, but they weren't thinking nine years. They were getting three or four years as, as a pitcher. I think most of his time with the Dodgers is going to be spent as – a hitter and and that's what i'm currently focused on well you can also be focused on trying to win a world series they've got a couple games left here to do it and we will of course talk to you uh i'm sure very soon when, when they actually. do it you can say it peter when they win the world series we'll talk again no jeff you can say that i can't say that but but you said it so i just said it Stay up to date on the L.A. Dodgers all year long by subscribing to Locked On Sports today and Locked On Dodgers on your favorite podcast app and on YouTube. Thanks for making Locked On Sports today your first listen. Coming up, the Colts believe the best way to salvage their season is to sit Anthony Richardson. Before we get to why they believe that, the Ravens got Lamar Jackson another weapon. Get ready to tackle the NFL action with FanDuel, America's number one sports book, because right now new customers can bet $5 and get $150 in bonus bets if you win. The FanDuel Sportsbook app gives you everything you need to place live bets on the NFL all in one place. So when you get a hunch in the middle of the game, you can check out the latest stats, view live play-by-play, -play, and so much more on the same page where you place your bets. Just visit FanDuel.com to join today. You'll get started with $150 in bonus bets if your first bet of five dollars or more wins and that winning five dollar bet could come with a week nine nfl game thursday night features a desperate new york jets side against the first place team in houston FanDuel likes the desperation they have aaron Rodgers and company favored by a point and a half I and mean, the texans and the jets have opposite records but i guess the texans are hurt at receiver i don't know that's FanDuel.com. never waste a hunch and make every moment more with FanDuel, an official sportsbook partner of the nfl the Baltimore Ravens acquired Deontay Johnson from the Carolina Panthers on Tuesday, and they aren't giving up all that much for him. From this move only, just separating it from all of other Baltimore's needs, of all of those needs, I think it's a really solid move. I think for a receiver of Deontay Johnson's caliber, giving up your own fifth-round pick for Carolina's sixth-round pick, I mean, that's essentially getting him for free because you're probably only moving down what? If, if, you know, not saying the Ravens are winning the Super Bowl or anything, but let's say their pick is in the mid to high 20s, low 30s this year, and Carolina has a top five, top 10 pick, you're probably only moving down, what, five, 10 spots to go get a player who can help you now in Deontay Johnson. He's going to be a free agent after this season, but now the reports are that Carolina is helping Baltimore out with this deal and paying some of his remaining salary. So the move would have been, he'd have about, I believe three ish million dollars left on that deal. Carolina is paying some of that salary. So now I believe the number is 625,000 is what Baltimore is on the hook for. And speaking of receiver news, Texans wide receiver, Stefan Diggs has a torn ACL and will miss the rest of the season. Coach D'Amico Ryan's confirmed the news on Tuesday. Diggs was ranked seventh in the NFL in receptions and second on the team in receiving yards. Unfortunately, he tore his ACL, so he'll be out for the year. Uh, really hurt. hurts our team to hear that news, and he's been such an important part to our team and just everything that he bought, not only on the field but off the field, the energy, the leader, like the way he worked every single day. Uh, he brought a lot to our team, and we have to pick up the slack. A lot of guys have to step up, pick up the slack. But, um, you know, definitely praying for him to have a, a speedy, successful recovery. Uh, it's definitely a blow to us. In the association, the Philadelphia 76ers will be without Paul George and Joel Embiid again tonight. And the Embiid side of this has caused the Sixers 
to lose money. The NBA has fined the Sixers $100,000 for public statements around the health status of their all-NBA center. The NBA's investigation showed that the Sixers did not violate player participation policy with Embiid's missed games, but did so with the public comments that did not properly reflect his health issues with his knee. Comments made by Philadelphia's president of basketball operations, Daryl Morey, and coach Nick Nurse were, quote, inconsistent with Joel Embiid's health status and in violation of NBA rules. Anthony Richardson has now joined Bryce Young as 2023 top quarterback prospects to be benched. The Colts going to Joe Flacco. Anthony Richardson right now, a 44% completion percentage on the season, a passer rating below 60. It has not exactly been spectacular, though, of course, if you just put the highlight real plays together, they're as impressive as any quarterback in the NFL. Jake Arthur from Locked on Colts joins me now. And Jake, um, what, what strikes me about this is this is a Colts team that is right now four and four second in the AFC South. They are right in the middle of the AFC playoff race. So why make this move now? You know, the only feasible reason I could see that they would do it, because I'll say I don't I don't necessarily agree with that. I don't think Anthony's been good enough, but I don't think I agree with this move. It would only be if they fear that they are losing the locker room or faith in Anthony based on his level of play versus what Joe Flacco has given you. Like what Joe Flacco did in like the two games and change with Anthony Hurt already eclipsed what Anthony is, has basically done, plus the tapping out thing. Um, yeah. I don't know. Explain that for people that... who don't know the context of that, please. Sure. Okay. So um, in this this last game, uh, Anthony had he, – he ran quite a bit. I think two or three plays in a row. Um, and, and, like, he, he was visibly gassed. And – he just didn't feel he had it in him to run the next play. And, you know, the tap out, literally they, they tap on their helmet to get a sub in and he came out for a play going into a third down in the, the, you know, low red zone, essentially uh, where they, they really needed a touchdown. Um, obviously quarterbacks don't normally do that. You kind of have to peel their corpses off of the field to get them off. Mm -hmm. uh, so, for that to even be an option in a quarterback's mind was pretty interesting. Um, I don't know fully yet how it reverberated through the locker room. We'll, we'll get in there and talk to them tomorrow, but I know Shane Steichen spoke to Richardson about it. I know Ryan Kelly spoke to Richardson about it. So there's at least two critical guys who felt it needed to be addressed. Um, so the Colts, you know, publicly and through source stuff have not, they, they've said, the tapping out thing didn't have anything to do with it. Uh, it's been more the performance, but I don't know. The optics of it all are not great. Um, I don't think it makes sense because it does it turning to Joe Flacco, whether it's for a game, two games, rest, rest of the season, whatever it is. I don't really know what it accomplishes for you other than to save face in the locker room. And, and I think that's part of why this is so strange because Sure, the Colts are an ascending team, we believe. Shane Steichen is, is certainly a coach who has a lot of fans in the league, in the media. Um, but I don't think any reasonable Colts fan or NFL fan thought this was an AFC contender this season, which raises the question of why you would do this now. And I think it also raises the question, at least for me, of a, a, a coach and an organization. Does Shane Steichen have the gravitas to make a move like this um and and does chris ballard make a move like this out of a little bit more desperation than maybe we realize if the owner is going hey we got to win some games like we, we can't worry about long-term development i want to win some games like right now today mm -hmm. yeah i i would find it hard to believe that this was just shane on his own making that call I would imagine it was at least him and Ballard. I mean, we'll, we'll find out maybe more about that. It might take, you know, digging into some sources a little bit, uh, but we'll talk to Shane tomorrow. We'll at least ask like, you know, who all was involved in this situation. Um, but, you know, as the head coach, he's got to have the pulse of the team. Um, personally, the product on the field, 
like the offense probably will function better with Flacco out there. That's not a mystery. What we've seen out there, the offense at least flows a little better. Like there, there's more rhythm to it, but it disrupts your investment and the time you knew it was going to take for Richardson. Um, I know the, like his stat line is God awful. Don't get me wrong. And, and from your perspective, I would say his worst game was against the Packers. The Packers have kind of had that effect on. It looks, on teams it looks pretty year. bad. Yeah. That was a game where I have no defenses to it. That was a terrible game. But like this, this last one, for example, against the Texans, 10 of 32. I don't, I've never seen a quarterback stat line so bad. Uh, 10, 10 other of than it was pretty brutal. It's, it's pretty bad, but there is so much context in there. Um, he was throwing a lot of dots downfield. This is just a team that relies far too heavily on the downfield passing game to where if those things aren't clicking, there's zero rhythm. You cannot maintain drives. They have so many three and outs and, and just short drives because there's, there's no short and intermediate mixed into it. The only routine yards they have in this offense is Jonathan Taylor on the ground. That's it. That's the only thing that moves the chains for them. Everything else is so downfield, like at least beyond the sticks is like the shortest things they do in the passing game. Um, so a, a lot of it is on Anthony, but a lot of it is on play calling. You're probably going to see a lot of low lights of, of receivers not getting separation, dropping the ball, coming out on the wrong end of 50, 50 balls. Like yeah. it's a, everyone shares the blame. Um, I don't think Anthony's been so bad that, He's the one that needs to get yanked out of this thing. And again, ev everybody on the planet knew that this guy was going to take time to develop. He got hurt, of course, early for the year in his rookie season last year. And, you know, we're only midway through the year this year. He's had 10 starts. It was going to take longer than that. Uh, that's that's why this doesn't make sense to me unless it was something like, God, you know, like, the locker room is, is going to start getting antsy it, or, or, you know, the coaching staff in front office doesn't want to lose the, the trust of the locker room either. You know, they see it's a veteran in Joe who has been very productive when he was in there. Um, again, I don't, I don't know yet how much the, the tapping out thing reverberated through the ro locker room, but that is the most sensical thing I can think of as to why you would do this at this time. Stay up to date all year on the Indianapolis Colts by subscribing to Locked On Sports today and Locked On Colts on your favorite podcast app and on YouTube. Coming up, the Titans do not need to draft a quarterback this year. When you're bad in the NFL, you get a high draft pick. When you got a high draft pick in the NFL, you usually take a quarterback unless you have one, and the Titans don't. But according to our Locked On Titans host, Tyler Rowland, the Titans should not do that in the upcoming draft as there is way more talent and other key positions of need for the Titans to draft. The Titans are going to ha have a high enough pick to maybe get their, their pick of the litter in that regard. Again, I like Sanders the most. I like Ward after that, a little more riskier of a pick, but higher upside probably as well. And then for the second round group, I like Garrett Nussmeyer from LSU, but I don't think that the Titans as things stand right now, should pick a quarterback. And I know that a lot of you guys will freak out when I say that. Like, how could you possibly believe that? Blah, blah, blah. But I'll explain why. There are two different schools of thought here when you look at the way to build a roster in the NFL. Some people say you find the quarterback first, and then you build around that quarterback. We've seen that work before. Think about, like, the Bengals with Joe Burrow. But there are other schools of thought where you build up the roster as best as you can so that when you do draft the quarterback, he has a proper supporting cast around him. And where this Titans roster is at right now, they need help in the pass rush. They need multiple young wide receivers. They need another right tackle. Like, I don't think the Titans are too far away from being a competitive football team, but I think they are missing talent in some key spots. Like to me, pass rush, pa edge rusher, pa we'll say pass rush in general because interior defensive line is pass rush as well. But the Titans have Simmons and they have Sweat. And I think they're good there. Sebastian Joseph Day has been a really nice addition to the team. 
But that second edge rusher position outside of Harold Landry. And who knows what happens with Harold Landry after this year. The Titans could choose to move on since he doesn't have any more guaranteed money on his contract. He's going to be a 29-year-old edge rusher. Like, maybe the Titans want to move on and save some money there. I don't think that would be wise, but we don't know what they might do. So to me, with the type of talent that is available at those three positions, wide receiver, offensive tackle, and edge rusher, at the top of this class, I would not feel comfortable taking a shot on one of the quarterbacks that I think is more risky. If you needed more evidence to not draft a quarterback, look no further than the draft in which the Titans drafted a quarterback most recently. Will Levis is hurt, but was on the path to being benched in Tennessee. Anthony Richardson just got benched. Bryce Young was benched a month ago. Bryce Young was the number one overall pick. Anthony Richardson was a top 10 pick. Will Levis was a top 50 pick. And their careers right now are very much in the balance. CJ Shroud is looking like a good player, but he's getting his butt kicked behind a bad offensive line with a mediocre at best offensive coordinator playing quarterback in the league is really hard. If anything, the Tennessee Titans need to go the other way. They went out and spent money this offseason. They go out and they get Legereus Sneed. They go out and they get Calvin Ridley. They, they had DeAndre Hopkins. This defense is legitimately good right now, today but they don't have a quarterback. Drafting one is not the way to do that. This team needs to go out and spend money on one. Get a bridge quarterback. They could have had Andy Dalton or Joe Flacco. This is an opportunity for this team to go try and win football games next year. And by the way, if they don't, there's going to be a lot of questions about the amount of money that was spent on this team and the overall team building strategy. They tried to prop up Will Levis, so they built the team around him, and it turns out Will Levis probably not the guy. Okay, well, now, if you think you have the team, and by the way, I do. I like this Titans team, except for the quarterback. But you got to get the quarterback right, and that is a lot easier said than done, as the Titans are finding out. And finally, receivers, they are the best posters. They really are. A wide receiver posted a picture of his number three jersey on Instagram and says, free. Three, Minnesota Vikings wideout Jordan Addison posted that exact thing, which sparked a wave of interpretation that Addison says is all wrong. He says the post is something he's done since college, and it's just a post. It's kind of like a nickname. It doesn't mean he wants to be traded. It doesn't mean he wants more targets. It's just a post. Addison said people just try to make something out of nothing. It ain't nothing. It may not be nothing, but it may not be something. That's also what I, but if I have a bad tweet, I'm just like, well, it's just social media. I'm not, I'm not Jordan Addison. So different level of scrutiny on that one. If you're catching this episode after hearing your favorite Locked On show, make sure to subscribe to Locked On Sports today on YouTube or wherever you get your podcast so you never miss an episode. Also, if you're a new subscriber to Locked On Sports today, we're here for you with the biggest stories in sports every day. Coming up on the next Locked On Sports today, is there anything and I mean anything for Aaron Rodgers and the Jets to salvage at this point in the season. So at least until tomorrow, stay locked on sports today. Locked On Podcast Network presents Locked On Sports Today. Go to our video on demand. Click on sports at the top of your screen. There you'll find past episodes of Locked On Sports Today, plus other Locked On shows on demand.